Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. I'm joined by the dream team of Tony Haggerty, Laura Bradbourne, Russell Boyce and Lawrence Conley to talk about Celtic versus Falkirk. Second half, far, far better than the first, Laura, but we didn't get the four or the five that we were looking for, did we? No, we didn't, but we um, we saw Falkirk in a lot more uh, the type of manner that you would have expected us to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's took a few chances, had a bit of fortune with a couple of them. Um, but, you know, we dispatched them in a short space of time the way you would hope and expect us to do so. Um, and yeah, made made the first half look a lot more of a struggle than it even already did look when we were playing it. I think we just, as always, we, we just need to improve on what we lack in the final third as Russell said uh, after the first half we we just don't seem clinical enough and if we could sort that out I think we'd be looking at a very different team Absolutely I, I banged on about the amount of chances we'd had the amount of shots we'd had at goal in the two and a half games under Kennedy I'm going to ask you Tony Haggerty was that the rip-roaring free-scoring never-boring Glasgow Celtic? <laughs> After they scored the first goal, yeah. A bit of a struggle up till they got the break of the ball and the first goal deflection. But after that it was it was never in doubt, was it? The wave after wave after attack and you know, it could have finished five, six easily. But they played like a team who were two divisions above the team they were playing after they got the first goal. They took the first goal to relax everybody. And everybody just took an out and out take a breath and went, right, that's it, we've got the first goal, we can relax now. And, and, and they did start to play a wee bit of football. So, you know, but they had huffed and puffed up until then. Mm-hmm. Can't say they didn't. You know, and I, and I, and I posed the question at halftime, what if it ended 1-0 and people said, that, that'll never happen. Mm-hmm. But that, it was a worry, a genuine concern that we weren't being clinical, as Russell said, and they hadn't scored. But once they scored, they just seemed to breathe after they scored. They really did, and they started to knock it about. And as I say, it could have been a lot more. And they and they played actually played pretty decent stuff. But I'm allowing for the opposition, you know, yeah. the standard of opposition. Uh, after that, but it took the first goal to sort of get the shackles off them. If you know what I mean. I mean, can I? I don't know. I'm not seeing a fear factor. Not not necessarily. Fear of fault, but just a fear to express themselves, I think, playing within themselves a wee bit. Absolutely, why. absolutely. It's something that Neil Lennon brought up a few times, Tony. I mean, Russell, why would the, the team be playing like that? I mean, it was mentioned that the pressure of 10 in a row was uh, weighing heavy on their shoulders. I mean, they're playing, I, I feel they should have been playing without that kind of fear because they're playing in front of no fans. And I've heard the theory around how that affected Celtic in a different way from other clubs. But surely um, that stature, when you're at that level, you should be be able to deal with that that level of pressure as well because it was evident I agree with Tony it was evident um, and you could almost see that weight being lifted after the first goal why has that been such an issue this season? Um, it's hard to put your finger on it but I mean I think there's certain things I think can put doubt in a team's mentality now for me does it really exude confidence in the in the, in the, the Celtic lineup when you go one up top at home to a team, as you've rightfully pointed out, two divisions below. What mindset does that give them subconsciously? Is there, is, does that suggest there's seeds of doubt here? We need to play a wee bit more carefully. I mean, for me, we've got an, uh, you know we've got strikers there that are desperate for game time. Mm-hmm. We've touched on a Yeti a million times. Kamala is another example, although we don't know about the New York situation or whatever. And um, there's Griffiths, and then of course there's there's odds on Edward. And um, we seem to be obviously playing players that are leaving anyway this summer, so. Why would he be an exception? Um, I would like to have thought we would have been a bit more bold in the in the starting lineup, and I think that can give the players more belief. Like they're going to go out there and dominate. There's two strikers, play three. I don't know what the. Well, I don't know why there's there's seems to be shackles put on them by the definition of the lineup that then I think sort of breeds into the teams. I don't know. As I said at, at halftime, I thought it was a lack of killer instinct. And I don't know if subconsciously when you're playing these sort of lineups, three number 10s against a team two divisions below you at home, 
I think the more ambitious the lineup, the more self belief the team has when they start the game. And I, 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 that would be my sort of take on it as to why perhaps they very much played within themselves before they got the uh, before they got the first goal. I thought um, John Joe Kenny was the the exact epitome of that. I thought he played very safe first half, and then you've seen the difference in him once we were a goal up. He suddenly looked like you know this up and down fullback. He was getting him behind. He was nearly scoring a goal at one point. Um, I thought you know you compare that with his first half performance and. I don't know. I mean, that's just a theory. I just don't know if maybe one up top at Falkirk sets a mindset that's maybe mm. a wee bit more negative than it needs to be. Well, I, I, I remember back to one time this season where we actually broke that mindset. I think most of us were surprised with the performance against Lille. But the, the way that we broke it, I think, Russell, was we, we threw in Turnbull, Sorrow and, and Hazard that night, didn't we? And it, right. it believed life into that side for quite a few weeks, actually. You know, to the point where um, it was a surprise really going into the Scottish Cup final that um, Soro didn't make it. Allegedly, yep. he had uh, food, given himself food poisoning. So, Lawrence, do you think maybe Kennedy's playing it a wee bit too safe? I, I know that at some stages since Lennon left, Kennedy has been the favourite to take over. I don't think anybody expects that to take to, to actually happen. So, should Kennedy not be a, a little bit more adventurous in his lineup uh, initially? Because yeah. uh, you know that first half was was really yeah, really poor to watch. Yeah, it should be. I, I think it should be more adventurous in, in this lineup. But, but listen, you know, I think not having a fans affect us. You know, in boxing, you sometimes get get jump fighters. You can do it when no one's about, but put in front front of a crowd, you go to pieces. That was always my problem. Crowd. Always my problem with the football, Lawrence. Mm-hmm. That. <laughs> well, well, that was it. You know, I, I saw that when uh, the old farm greats got up to five people watching, they went to pieces. <laughs> but, but wait a minute before we move on for that Lawrence before we move on for that were you at the game where I snapped Alex Ray just to try and get a wee bit back here were you at that game I've never seen you that photo you took mate but uh... <laughs> I did snap Alex Ray, by the way, for all the everybody tuning in um, just to get a wee bit of kudos back from that Lawrence no no what he did which was uh, appreciated by some of his watching. But, but not by yeah, Alex himself, I because I think well, he wanted a square goal. Anyway, yeah, sorry, yeah. back to you, Lawrence. Back to you. And, and, and what about the ref man? He seems to be affected uh, <laughs> by this discalculia that's broken out in the south side of Glasgow. You know, he's, we're half a yard outside the penalty box with a free kick, and he's put them level with a penalty spot. He's, you know, these things aren't even difficult, and he done the same in the first half. Yeah, it's all about consistent. It's all about consistency. I was going to come back to you on the uh, the officials' performance, Lawrence, but seeing how you brought it up. Um, but you know, <laughs> when we're talking, when we're talking about uh, the strikers, Russell, you brought up the point, and James comes in on the YouTube channel. James Pearson, thanks for joining us. Without Eddie, next season we think, and I think we all fully expect Eddie to believe in Celtic Park. We are in dire straits up front. No one really taking their chances this season by the scruff of the neck. A good few. Uh, have players listen th- this this for me if you go back to the beginning of the season we were in a situation where we had more or less seen the partnership of Eduard and Griffiths turning round last season's campaign so I think we were going into this season we had backup in the likes of Patrick Lamalla and then we had strengthened it by bringing in a Swiss internationalist who hadn't uh, performed that well for West Ham but had done so for, for Baal previously and I th- at that point I thought we were in a good position you move forward to, to April and I agree with James, I think we are in dire straits because when you're given chances to the likes of Lee Griffiths as we did tonight albeit only an hour Laura um, I'm not getting enough to suggest that we're going to be safe next season um, I'm expecting Eddie to go, as Russell said earlier, we're, we're expecting Patrick Clamalla to, to move to New York, we're not sure if it's a loan deal or a permanent deal. Bio's playing football in the second tier of French football, he's never going to be a Celtic striker, and it certainly isn't working out for a Yeti. So, you're looking at that scenario if we do lose Eddie, and that looks likely, we need to bring in at least two strikers. Yeah, it goes back to what we were talking about um, at half time, you know, the, the whole being excited with the transfers when they did come in because all of us were sitting thinking, well, we've got two good strikers in Eddie and and Griffiths and we've brought in Klamala, who's a young player that that obviously has 
potential or we assumed must have had potential and a Yeti who, who has you know a proven track record elsewhere and you're thinking four four strikers you know that's what any top team should be aiming for and like you say we're, we're in a situation where we, we might have none from next season I think Griffith's time at the club is absolutely up tonight proved that without a doubt Eddie I don't think we're going to have a choice in the fact that we lose him Clamalla looks like he's on his way out and a Yeti I have been I've been one of the people saying give him time give him a chance he's not had enough games and whatever he got half an hour in a game we were dominating against Falkirk who are two divisions below us and couldn't get a sniff at goal I think he had one sort of a half decent chance that he dragged wide of the post if he can't if he can't score in those circumstances, then I don't I don't see him as a particularly reliable option for us going forward. So the idea that you have to um, bring in two strikers in the summer is going to be a major issue, not only because you can never guarantee that the purchases you bring in are going to be successful, as we've seen, but you're playing in a situation where they're the most expensive and sometimes least amount of value in the market. You're, you're paying top dollar for strikers over any other position. So, so you know, we're, we're, we're kind of hands tied behind their back as far as that's concerned. And I don't even, I can't even offer a name of somebody coming through the ranks that you might be able to stick in who, who have heard anything decent about from the youth team. So it's not even as if we've got that option either. Colin, for the price of Klamala and Ayeti, mm. you couldn't have died in Tony. Mm-hmm. Right. Throw, throw Bio in there as well because Bio was a couple of million pounds. Well, see, no, no, you're no. on those three, right? You could have had Ivan Tony. See if you're a goal scorer, you're a goal scorer. You score goals at any level. Nobody, nobody really heard of Gary Hooper when he came north of the border, but he scored goals. You know, so when you score goals, you'll score at any level. And people say, "Oh, I'm not paying ten million pounds for a guy that's playing the third tier of English football." That's the market you're in. If you really want to sign a player like that, you're going to have to pay that kind of dosh. You know, yeah. you can pay that up over a period of time. You know, taking it up to ten million or whatever, as the deal turned out to be when he went to Brentford. So mm. this guy is lighting the place up at Brentford. And Barry Fry more or less said, "Celtic, take this guy. He will score a barrel load of goals. He's worth the money." Mm-hmm. And, he, and he tried and tried and tried because the player was seemingly keen on a move to Celtic now now you have no chance you know so you have to turn around at some point and say we need a goal scorer this guy's a proven goal scorer at a certain level but see mm-hmm. if you're a striker you really need to be poor to fail at Celtic you really do right or just it doesn't happen for you and no. it, and we've signed two guys and it's not happened yet now you can argue they've not had enough game time but I've not seen enough in either a Jetty or Klamala to say to me, they're the man who I would trust going forward with any manager, never mind Eddie Howe. There's not enough in there. And the, those two players to say to me, they've got a killer instinct. So you but, have to turn around and say sometimes, do you know what? We made a hash of that by not signing Ivan Tony when we could have got him for an optimal price. Well, what you're saying there, Tony, uh, I think it's exemplified by the fact that we created 60, 62 chances. 62 chances we created in two and a half games. So if you're a goal scorer, you're going to you're going to score goals within that the realms of that 62 chances. You're going to, I mean, not all of them are falling to the same player, but you're going to score goals in a situation like that if you're creating that number of chances in two and a half games. And if you're a striker with a pure, like Ivan Tony looks like he is, then he would have he would have taken a fair percentage of those chances, yeah. Now some some might say that Clamalla's not had a decent run in the in the team, but what you just said there, Tony, when you really need to count on someone and you throw them in and he's three and a half million quid, um, you know, when we when we brought him in, that moment for me was the first game against Rangers this season. He led the line that day. And he was anonymous, absolutely anonymous that day. And that was due to the fact, apparently, uh, that a Yeti pulled out very, very late on. A Yeti was meant to be leading the line that day and he pulled out very late on through some kind of injury or illness at that time. And Clamalla was thrown in, but he was anonymous. So we're now in a situation where what do you get for your five million that we spent on a Yeti? 
uh, because you know we can't really operate in that market now, Tony. Because what you get is you get a Swiss striker who barely plays and barely scores. Now, Colin Watt. I've got to give him credit for this on the WhatsApp, reminded me of that conversation that Fergus McCann had with David Ginola uh, when he was up in Glasgow talking about signing for Celtic. And in that meeting was also uh, Willie Hockey. I think he was just Willie back then. He's now Lord Hockey, of course. And uh, the immortal line, but can he do it on a wet Tuesday night against Falkirk? And tonight, Laura, can a Yeti do it? on a Saturday night against Falkirk? The answer is no, he can't. No, um, and like you say, it's not for... Um, in ordinary circumstances, you might say, you know, he didn't get provided with the chances, he's a decent enough finisher, but if he doesn't get the chances provided to him, then he's not going to score. The chances were there tonight, and he didn't take them. And um, it's another situation where we have just throwing money down the drain at players of his stature and calibre who I think personally there are a lot of players, possibly himself included, who think that coming to the Scottish game is a bit of an easy payday and and, uh, not too difficult and they go up here and they get the shock of their lives and I think he probably falls into that category Um, and I don't see him having a future beyond this summer. The only problem we have now is can we offload him? Because nothing that he's shown this season would suggest anybody's going to be in desperate hunt for his signature either. Well, this is the thing, Russell, we've been speaking about Ayeti and Barkas because they both came in for a combined transfer fee of around £10 million. Pounds. They were the reported transfer fees. How much do you get for players like this after a season we've just had if you have to offload them? I mean, if Barkas goes back to uh, to Greece, for example, what are you looking at? Two and a half million? Well, totally. I mean, I get that point. My worry is, as well, if we do think that the Clamalla thing's a wee bit lightly, Edward, everyone seems to think, so stick on. You left out Yeti and Griffiths. A Yeti, rightfully pointed out by Laura there, didn't cut the mustard tonight at all. But in actual hindsight, neither did Griffiths, to be perfectly honest. He said, you know, the two missed chances first half being a key point. But can you afford to let all four go? And now my worry would be you're going to need to stick with one. Which one do you choose? And for me, the honest, the honest answer is I think it becomes back down to Lee Griffiths gets, you know, his nine lives, you know, come back into play and he, he gets another go because he's the one you're going to, out the four, you would still think has the track record and has, you know, just, I don't know, the, the, the knowledge of the game, the experience, the goal record, and you just feel that out of all of them, you're going to need to keep one. You can't. You, there's no way we can let all four strikers go as well. I just don't see that happening in time before the Champions League. And I think Lee Griffiths may by default be, yet again, Celtic's luckiest squad member. I think he actually might stay on. Well, I'll, I'll come over to Lawrence to, to speak about that. We know his goal-scoring record has been brilliant throughout his career. Even at Wolves, he's scored more than uh, a goal every two games. Yeah. And when you look at the last three seasons at Celtic, for various reasons, he's averaged something like 25 games a season, Lawrence. Um, his last really um, impressive season was five years ago where he scores 40 goals under Ronnie Dyler. Um But I take Russell's point. I mean, we can't be in that situation like we're going to be, it, it would seem, in the defence where our defensive uh, lineup, without us strengthening, will be uh, Ralston, Taylor, Welsh and Hendry as we sit here just now, if Ayer was to go. So when we're looking at the striker situation, Lawrence, uh, Russell says one in nine likes. I think he's had a few more than that. Um, <laughs> if he was to go to a team like Aberdeen, I would fully expect him to score 20 goals a season for Aberdeen. Yeah, that's bad to what Tony's saying. Goal scorer is goal scorer. Uh, you know, uh, he's got a year left in his contract. I'm not sure we're really going to get paid for him. It's got to be worth keeping a goal scorer on the squad. You know, Howe's already, I, I would have thought how part of Howe's interview, if he's going to be the man, it's kind of two of his three. He's going to be watching up all the tapes. And he, he'll he already have earmarked some of the guys for the door and some guys, you know, have seen something he thinks he can work with. And yet he's looking like a team of Pookie. You know, he, he's uh, two town get a a tune of them, I don't know. Clamaro, I've not really seen a lot. One's about a bit, puts his hair about, but neither of those two really fall into the goal scorer c- category, which is probably worrying when you're a forward. 
if you don't fall into the goal scorer category. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> Well, you're looking at goal scoring and as we've seen in the second half, on comes uh, Mohamed El Yunusi and he scores his 15th of the season. Great wee dink actually uh, to get the goal. He's on loan. There's uh, an option, I, I believe, to buy for around 5 million quid. It brings us to the point, Laura, of the loanees. I think we're all uh, of the same opinion around Shane Duffy. Um, I really feel for Shane Duffy. I really do. I mean, he's, he's kind of been open season on Shane Duffy all season. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that... Th- he'll be hurting that things haven't worked out for him um, big time you know this season mm-hmm. because he's a Celtic supporter that was his dream move etc he's had a bit of personal crisis uh, throughout the season as well and you know but we're, we're all expecting him to go back to Brighton where do we stand with El Yunusi, Kenny and Luxo and, and I'm going back to the defensive issue because this is a massive rebuild do you try and extend the loan deals of the two fullbacks? do you try and, and do a deal for El Yunusi coming back uh, on a permanent basis well, I mean, it kind of it kind of expands on the point that I think um, Lawrence and Russell have made about about Griffiths, which I, to be honest, I kind of disagree with, and I, I would say the same with the loan players. Is I don't know where the desperation comes from to hang on to like kind of mediocre players just for the sake of having bodies in. Like I, Elliot you say if he's going to cost five million to keep him, to me he's not done anything to suggest that five million is is an amount of money you would want to spend on him. Kenny has filled a hole that was missing from Frimpong but you would hope with a bit more time and a bit more scouting you could get somebody who's who's more up to scratch than he is. Um, and Griffiths, for all he's done over the years, scoring goals, um, I, I I think his time's done, and and he's not. I, I don't see him getting back to the heights he was at. So, taking into account Griffiths and the loan players, my my basic point is, I don't think I've seen anything from any of them that I would be clamouring to keep them in a Celtic shirt for next season. I would be saying. Thanks for seeing us through the rest of this season, but you know you would hope with the new manager and the new structure coming in that they've got players identified that they want to get in, and you don't force a bunch of players who didn't live up to standards this season on a new manager next season and hamper what he wants to do when he comes in. What about yourself, Tony? I, I mean, I, I think it, I take your point. I mean, they're not Eddie Howe's, and I'm saying that I'm taking it for granted that it will be Eddie Howe. They're not his players. He had he played no part in them coming in. So why should he want to keep them on um, as loanees? We're moving in very quickly to the the first fixture, Tony, and whoever comes in will be looking at you know a threadbare defence, uh, whereby they might even say we need two right backs because are you really confident going into next season with Ralston being your backup right back? and Taylor being your, your backup left back I would trust Eddie Hitton's judgement implicitly on footballers and I would trust that he would spend if you're talking about Elian Usi costing 5 million quid no for me it's a definite no for me because I think Eddie Howe could invest 5 million quid a hell of a lot better than on Elian Usi you know defenders is something he's going to have to really be watching from now on in because we are struggling and but I mean, what defence and attack were struggling. Mm. You know, we're, we seem to be okay midfield wise, but you're looking at what three three new defenders, possibly four, and two attackers. You know, the, you're looking at so you're looking at well, that's much more than half a team, and, and a goalkeeper possibly. <laughs> that's, yeah. that, that's seven off the top of my head. You know, that, that's the kind of rebuild that Eddie Howe could be possibly looking at. Mm-hmm. If you're not going to keep any of the lone players and none of them have done anything that you've, that's, you know, to, to make you think, wow, they should stay. Laura said there, Kenny's filled a hole. Shane Duffy's just had an absolute shocker on, and, you know, of, on the park of the shocker and off the park, he's had some real tough issues to deal with, personal issues and you know, it's just not worked out. It's it's what a dream move turned into an absolute nightmare for him. And mm-hmm. just to, 
sorry to, to sorry to jump in, Tony, but I'm just I'm seeing a lot of people in the chat saying, you know, lay off Duffy. He's he's had a terrible season. He's he's lost his dad and all that. And I think everybody at some point on this podcast has said we have the utmost sympathy for for what he's gone through. And and thankfully there are some of us here who don't know what that feels like. There are some that do. I. I fully appreciate that he must have had a terrible season and it must have affected things but at the end of the day we are here to judge yeah. what he's done on the pitch for Celtic Everything's and he hasn't good. been up to scratch and so if, yeah. if he hasn't been we have to say that regardless yeah. of what the circumstances are for it. And I think we've always said it with a caveat as well Laura you know we've always, mm-hmm. we've always appreciated the fact that he's had a really really tough time of it. He's had a nightmare he's had an absolute nightmare if you're talking about playing wise so you can't escape that. We're not escaping that. And we have said that. You know, so you, he, he goes back. Laxalt goes back. Kenny goes back. Leaving you with who? Welsh. I am maybe away. Mm. Welsh and Ralston. You, so you're looking at four defenders. Yeah. But, uh, that's probably the reason you, if it is how you want to win now, you know, look at Petter. Before Anil came in, would you have kept Petter on? After that season he'd had, mm-hmm. there is absolutely no way you'd have kept Petty. You'd been get him out the door. Yeah, and he comes in and revitalises him. And you're hoping that whoever the new manager is can do that with at least a couple of the players, preferably ones we own, because so it's not costing us more money. You know, if if he does it with the the loanees, it's part of the budget going. But as we said in the first half, you're hoping that Eddie Howe is watching just now. You know, and it's got to be, hasn't it? You know, it has to be correct. It has to be if, if, if he is the man, so he, he has to have started that process of doing his who's own. Putting the players, who's putting the players out on loan just now? Who's making the football decision of what players go out on loan? Surely, that if he is the man and there's a verbal agreement, he's involved in that. Going, listen, get these guys out on loan. I need to see them competitively. Mm-hmm. See if they can do it. You know, when there's a bit of pressure on, maybe mm-hmm. not in front of a crowd just now, but at least they're out playing. Top well, the boy uh, was County Hegelder. He's yeah. looking decent in the back for them. You know, yes, well, he's he's possibility. You know, he, he's seven, seventeen year old, Lawrence. I think you know going into next season. And and by the way, I, I've seen it before. We all have a player at that age, but I just think we're so threadbare. I think I, I sent you the stats, didn't I? Nine defenders on the books, and that goes right down to Hegelder. Seventeen average appearances. 15 average age 21 that's how bad if Ayer goes of course that's how bad it's going to be for the incoming manager so in terms of a budget Tony I mean it's not just a sizable budget it's going to be a massive budget now of course a lot of that you know will be coming in from sales of the likes of what we would expect you know Edward Christie and potentially Ayer as well I mean do you reckon all three of the names uh, are going to go I mean because we, we're kind of half expecting that to be the case but will anybody Ayer, for example, I know you and I disagree about this, but do you think he might say if someone like Eddie Howe comes in, maybe I should stay for another year? And part of, you know, as part of his own development. Well, we'll see how good a manager Eddie Howe is if Ayer decides to stay and he makes him a better player. Mm-hmm. And then he'll go for even more money than he's supposed to be projected to be going for now. You know my thoughts on Ayer. I gave it the other day, yesterday on the pod. I just think he's not commanding enough for a man of his size and stature. And I would let him leave if he wants to go. But if Eddie Howe's decision on that's different and judgment on that's different to mine, then I'm behind the Celtic manager if it is Eddie Howe. I'm behind everything that he does. We'll get behind him and he'll make those critical decisions because he might be a better place to make them than me. But again, I'll go back to this. I'm I'm going on my evidence based what I'm seeing with Ayer. Might not be popular. In fact, it's pretty unpopular. But I don't care. Nobody can make up my mind on what I see in I or a player. And I gave that opinion yesterday. And a few people got in touch to say I was wrong. There is no right and wrong here. It's just opinion. And my opinion is that I or is not the player that a lot of people make him out to be. My opinion. Don't have to agree with it. You know, you, you mentioned the midfield, and I think all season. That's been a position that we have certainly had strength in numbers in the midfield, but that situation also is going to change. I mean, Scott Brown's already announced that he's leaving. We're expecting Ryan Christie to leave. We're expecting, I would think, 
Olivier and Cham to be on his way. Uh, Russell, does that all of a sudden become a concern as well? Do we need to strengthen every area of the park? Well, we do need to strengthen every area of the park, but there has to be a realism as well that, you know, it's un, it's just it's un, impossible to just... Everyone in isolation, right? It's easy to talk about the right, st- the, the right and wrong reasons to keep them or, or the pros and cons of the player. But if you realistically think we can just go into the season with that back line that you described, all four strikers away, and then doing that with half midfield as well, we're talking just a different language. No manager's going to want that. The manager needs to have some sort of skeleton of a squad. And whether that means some of those players are guys that maybe they're on the halfway house about, but are going to need to give the benefit of the doubt to and back their own managerial abilities to improve, that's going to have to happen. You cannot just clear out 15, 20 players. This is, you know, it's madness. I mean, the way we're going through each department, the more panicking I'm getting here because it looks like we need a keeper. And if I was Eddie Howe, the first thing I would do is just sign David Marshall, which should have been done last summer. That would be my first signing I would make and just watch him replicate what the guy across the city's done. Because he would. He would be, it would just be a perfect signing for Celtic. Tell him to free himself in Derby County and get David Marshall, and that would be the first move I'd make. But then you're looking at the defence. You're going through, I mean, this is madness what we're talking about here. And then four strikes every way. I can't keep up. I mean, maybe how he's going to say to you know, more players than he's going to bring in. This is I'll be... I'll be- I'll be totally honest, Russell, I've been getting obsessed with spring cleaning in my house and taking everything to the dump and I think it's transferred over to the Celtic team. I'm for shipping You've every got, single one of them out. You're using anyway. what? Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, forgetting the the pr- I'm forgetting the pressure washer out and just blasting that dressing oh. room because, honest to and God. That, and that's my point. For all the Griffiths' misdemeanours and all the negative stuff, you're going to need to pick at least one of these four that are going to need to stay up front. And for me... I think he might be the, the most likely to be to be kept on in that regard. Um, I mean, as for Ryan Christie leaving, you were talking about there in the midfield, this boy keeps trying to sc- score goal of the season. Goal of the season was scored by Declan McConville on Thursday when he described Noel Gallagher as what he described him as on the bulletin. <laughs> it's around eight minutes in, guys. If you watch the acts on bulletin on Thursday and you will see Celtic's goal of the season. Um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I agree. There's no love lost if if, if Christie does go. Um, for me now, I think those bridges are burned. I think he thinks he's a better player than he is. And I think Eddie Howe would actually embarrass him, to be honest with you. Once he starts coaching him how to be a footballer, I think he would actually, it would suit him to break away from that because I think Eddie Howe's going to be miles and miles ahead of him. Eddie Howe's going to go. Eddie Howe would give Ryan Christie a David Turnbull DVD, Russell. <laughs> Listen, at, at, at it's at so least, uh, true. But Ryan I, Christie's I, a better footballer than uh, Paul Cup Twitter seems to think he is. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Listen, that, 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 fo- that, that Falkirk Twitter thing was, uh, I mean, that was a silly thing to do. We all know we all know what Ryan Christie has done over this season, but you know, you've got to some, have some cojones on you if you're the if you're the Falkirk Twitter admin to think that you know it's going to stay nil nil against Celtic and that Ryan Christie might not have a an input into what's happening. They kind of set themselves up to be uh, set a rod for their own back as far as that one was concerned. It's wonderful though, Laura, what, what can happen when you try and keep a shot on the deck. You see, instead of going for top well, yeah. of the shot and, and seeing the headlines and seeing your name in light. So that's the problem. He's trying to go for these Hollywood goals all the time. And then when you actually see a controlled shot by Ryan Christie, because he's got the technical ability to do that, it I actually is a really to... natural finish. I was going to ask, actually, on that one, just as it comes up, what did you guys make of his celebration or lack thereof? It was the weirdest reaction to a goal I think I've ever seen. Now, Rory Hamilton said on the commentary that he was just disgusted with himself that it had taken that long. I read a bit more into it. I thought there was just a general frustration and a kind of see there's what I can do kind of attitude the same as he's, he's expressed before and I, I don't know I just I didn't like it but I don't know what you guys thought of it right. yeah, he always celebrates top in goals that's it he's like a, so well, to go, I, said, I, I was thinking he was surprised that he scored with a ferocious trundler you know what I mean <laughs> uh, you've just got to Laura you've just got to compare it to the reaction of James Forrest when he scored the goal Yeah, that's yeah, all you need to do 
you know, that's and, point. and that speaks volumes. And by the way, we can't live without James Forrest. So for any Celtic fan who's had their doubts uh, over uh, any season, we, we can't live without that guy. And I think tonight proved that once again. Now, it's been a quick 35-minute um, post-match because we've had four outstanding contributors and me um, on the Axon Bulletin. So thanks very much to Tony Haggerty, Laura Bradburn, Russell Boyce and Lawrence Conley for once again joining me on A Celtic State of Mind.